Hello, and welcome to the session Helping a Journal Apply to PubMed Central. You've never done it before. I'm Brian Cody. I'm one of the co-founders of Scholastica. Uh, and this session is recorded. I Right now, I'm working with my two-and-a-half-year-old nap time routine. Um, so I want to say I really appreciate LP Forum being flexible on formats. Sure, like many of you with children at home, the COVID-19 working situation is very challenging. So for me, being able to record the presentation um, and then do the live QA afterwards uh, really makes a difference for me being able to participate and I'm sure others as well. All right, so let's get into it. So as an overview of this session, we're gonna go over some lessons learned. Uh, we'll talk specifically, specifically about PubMed Central, also some other indexes, um, Google Scholar, uh, DOAJ, and generally working with different journals, different publishers, tips and strategies that uh, we've learned here at Scholastica. And then I really wanna emphasize during the Q&A, having other people share their experiences. We have a lot of experienced campus publishers. I think many of you have had some of the same experiences I'm going to speak to. And as librarians and people who are doing this day to day, you probably have quite a bit of in-depth knowledge that it would benefit other people to hear from. So when we talk about indexes, um, that's not generally my main forte. So Scholastica, I'll talk about this in a second, but we're a publishing platform. So we're software. We're not usually in the supporting role uh, that um, you know the publisher or uh, press's staff might be where they're day to day getting journals and indexes. Um, so we might be producing some of the XML or the metadata, but the actual applying for a journal to get into an index, that's not something we normally do or would be involved with because again, we're not a publisher. Um, my hunch is that many people on this webinar have been in a similar role where you're supporting journals who are publishing and who want to get into indexes, but you're not actually the publisher. So for example, you're not the one submitting the application. You're not the one who knows all the answers, but you're someone who those journals and publishers might be coming to for help. Uh, as I mentioned, because of that, and I think, again, what I'm going to share, I think will be wonderfully augmented by other people in the audience who have probably gone through this for discipline specific indexes. Well, I'm going to talk about PubMed Central, which is uh, specific to STEM. There are indexes in the humanities and social sciences that I'm sure uh, people have worked with their journals to get into and understanding what that process was like, any stumbling blocks um, that could be shared to help other people avoid that, I think would be really appreciated. So uh, where I come from in Scholastica, again, we're a software platform. We're used by over 900 journals across peer review, production, um, journal hosting. And so again, we're not a publisher, but because we're often hosting the content or providing content, um, if the journal's using us for peer review and then we're producing their XML or sending it places, uh, we're close enough that they often want our help. And so that's part of what happened here um, with PubMed Central. Before I get into that, I think it's always helpful uh, in case if your internet goes out in the next 20 minutes to know, well, what are the takeaways? And for getting an index, um, I think finding the official inclusion guidelines, always step one, and then understanding what those are involved, you know, sort of think of it as um, a self-education project, going through that. Ideally, then talk to someone who's done it before. We've worked with many campus-based publishers. When they have an index, they sort of, probably because they're researchers, think of it as a research project um, and don't think about the social side or the fact that there might be people around them who can sort of either help them or just do it for them. Talk a little bit about this, but often a vendor that they're using, uh, the software they're using, um, you know, the other journals in their field could talk about this, or even reaching out to the index itself. There are people who might say, oh, here's the answer. You don't have to read through many different documents to understand the answer. We can just tell you. And that's a huge time saver, uh, which is what everyone wants. Uh, another takeaway is 
sort of use the inclusion guidelines almost as, as if it was a grant evaluation. Think of, okay, it's gonna get a score or you need to check all these boxes. So go through and do an audit and make sure, you know, along the way, uh, you feel confident that this is a yes and that it would be very easy for someone to see it's a yes. That is very obvious um, that at each step you see it on your website or in the articles XML, depending on uh, depending on the index, what you're submitting, that you can clearly see the answer. And if not, again, reach out to the index, reach out to someone who's done this before, someone who would know the answer. And doing all that before you apply. Um, and I'll talk about this, but sometimes people sort of get into the application process and realize um, that even that there are things like especially technical that they sort of assume they can deal with later. Well, once you apply, sort of the assumption is everything's ready to go. So make sure that uh, your journal is set up to make it really easy for the index to check all the boxes and start including the journal in the index. So first we'll talk about PubMed Central. Um, so starting here, I'll tell a little bit of a story. Um, you know, we'll start at the very beginning. I find it's a very good place to start. Uh, that um, we originally had at Glasgow, we were working with a journal, uh, campus-based publication, um, medical journal. So residents and faculty publishing uh, content in their field, and they were applying to PubMed Central. And so they, during the uh, application process came to us with some questions. And I'll note that this is sort of a, a pretty similar experience we've we've seen. Um, so even though I'll talk about this journal's experience, we've now worked with small associations, some of these you know loose groups of academics who are publishing a journal. Um, and when they go to apply for the index, you know, no one on that, the journals might be academics and know how to run the journal. They've never applied for an index. They use a lot of these, you know, indexes or aggregators all the time for research, but the actual application process is something, you know, they've never experienced. Most people in their field have never experienced. They don't know about it. It's something often publishers are doing and editors aren't. So there's, um, they just don't have uh, a frame of reference that's very easy to access. And so when they come to us, often they're saying, here's the index, can you help us answer some of these questions? Now with PubMed Central, um, you know, again, we were the platform, uh, software platform, we had never applied with a journal to PubMed Central, because that's not what we do. We had journals who are uh, in many of these indexes who already use us, but someone saying, can you help with this? Well, there's a lot we had to learn. First, what is PubMed Central? Now, I had an idea of this, but I think for an audience, especially if anyone's, uh, if their publishing program um, through the library or on their campus is focused on humanities or social science, um, you might have a sense that, you know, PubMed Central is something to do with sort of life science and medical uh, articles, but, but, you know, understanding really what is it I think will be useful as we continue to talk about this. So the first thing for me, um, I don't have any medical training, I'm in STEM training. I did graduate school in sociology, um, and I did not use PubMed Central, I think, at all. Um, I uh, sort of come, want to share that because, again, I think for many people, my experience with indexes would, would be a lot of the services I use through libraries, um, and you think about different services like I would see JSTOR, but um, Web of Science. Um, uh, I mean, across these indexes, you know, ones that had a lot more content within sociology, where PubMed, uh, PubMed Central, Medline, we'll talk about this, didn't have things were relevant. So I didn't, I didn't come with any frame of reference. Um, so for me, there's a lot to learn. And on our team, um, that was, I think, pretty similar. There's some people who had some more experience, but no one was a sort of medical or STEM researcher by training. And so this is not something that we had a lot of um, institutional knowledge about already. So, you know, high level, um, and this is from an interview uh, Danielle and our team did with um, the program managers at uh, PMC. So uh, PubMed, you can see this, 
So there's a few words in this quote, PubMed, NLM, Medline, PMC. So as we got into this, we sort of also realized working with a few different journals, sometimes these words are used interchangeably. Um, you know, PubMed or PubMed Central or, you know, Medline. And depending on who's asking it, sometimes that's a very precise distinction. Sometimes it is a sense that these are roughly the same. Um, PubMed, PubMed Central sound very similar. Um, and then Medline and NLM, some people have a sense of what these are. So, uh, and some people don't. So let me kind of touch on this. So, uh, you know, these are th three words that were coming up a lot. Medline, PubMed, PMC, or PubMed Central. Um, so how do these relate? If we were live, I would do a Q&A with the audience, uh, but we're not, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so, uh, so at a high level, PubMed is a search. Um, it's an interface, so it's a, it's, um, an, uh, it's a place where scholars go and can get content. Now it pulls data from Medline and PubMed Central. Uh, Medline is not full text, or doesn't have to be. PubMed Central is full text. Um, so it pulls from these two, two resources to come up to the search. So we have seen many um, scholars, many journal editors, publishers will say PubMed, but when we talk about getting into an index, we actually need to know, are you trying to get into Medline or are you trying to get into PubMed Central? Because they're thinking, I use PubMed to search all the time. I want my journal there. But again, that search is drawing from two distinct sources that have different inclusion criteria. Um, this journal we were working with uh, was looking at PubMed Central, so a full text um, open access repository. Um, so we'll go sort of, you know, focus on that. So what are the um, inclusion steps for PubMed Central? So this is a high level, six steps. I'm gonna really focus on two, three, and four, because this is where I think a lot of the challenges are. Um, I will note, um, let me go forward. So when you see this is what the form looks like, when you look at this, there's sort of step one is submit application. And then there's you know the screening, sci essentially scientific quality, then technical pre-production. So these are all reviews and then it goes live. Um, I think that you know, what's sort of interesting is two, at least two of the publishers we've worked with, the idea, you know, they've experienced this sequentially. Okay, well, I can fill out the application. There's not that much information. I can get this going. And then as we get through each step, I'll, I'll respond to that. Uh, unfortunately, each step, there's essentially an off ramp. So you can be rejected at every step. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who want to get into this. Um, the, uh, people reviewing this, you know, sort of just like a journal needs to be considerate of their reviewers and how much time is involved there. There's only so much bandwidth for reviewing these applications. So the idea is, you know, you want to make it as easy as possible. So once you, once you submit, all these steps happen very easily versus submitting and assuming you'll figure out the scientific quality, make sure that's up to date later, um, because that could lead to a rejection. Um, so this first step, um, and I'm not going to go too into, I'm not going to actually fill the form with you, um, but you can see on the left some of the information that's required, um, you know, basic things you would expect. Uh, now, and it is worth emphasizing that while you'd expect it, for example, having an ISSN, um, we've had many publications where they, uh, sort of, you know, especially if they're newer, so if they're a couple years old, they might not have an ISSN or think they do, and they don't. And so, if, you know, if they're coming to you, Starting with this checklist of okay, do you have these? Do you have these pieces? Will be very useful. Um, and uh, if they don't, don't apply until you've gone and applied for your ISSN, received it. Um, that's just going to make everything easier. Not only at the application stage, but when we get to technical. Well, if you don't have an ISSN, including in the metadata, you're not going to pass that piece. So we'll come back to this. Um, so after that, there's an initial screen, and you can see here, again, it's interesting, I, I more and more think of this as the way journals uh, will do often do peer review is, you know, the author submits. First step is, you know, often a managing editor or the editor-in-chief or the handling editor is going to look at that article and say, is this relevant for the journal? Does it meet, does it clearly meet sort of minimum uh, standards the journal has? And so in this stage, um, for the PMC 
application, they're going to look at content. So is it within biomedical and life sciences? Um, is the peer review really clear? So if that's not clear, then that might sort of, if that's questionable, that uh, might lead to a no. And then, you know, looking at the kinds of articles. So if you look at these four kinds, uh, if, a, if a journal had a lot of editorial pieces, that would be a red flag and potentially be a problem. Um, and so that's something to be aware of and, and make sure that, especially if it's an earlier journal where they might have um, published a first issue that was meant to be maybe a little more um, uh, relevant or timely. And so a lot of their early content might not be these four kinds. That, that could really be um, a problem. So again, thinking with your uh, almost like a grant application hat on, is it very obvious that this is a check? And if not, uh, pull back and then uh, make adjustments or wait another issue or two before applying. So then there's scientific review, uh, scientific quality review, excuse me, and then the technical evaluation. Um, I'll speak to both of these more, especially the technical um, in a moment. I guess that moment's now. <laughs> so the, uh, you know, the technical requirements here are um, an individual XML file for each article. So this is something that, again, for journals applying, sometimes they, I'm trying to think how to say this, they might assume either they have that or that it's very easy to get. And I think, uh, I think a lot of our library publishers know that getting well struck, you know, uh, correctly structured XML is not super easy. There are lots of things that can sort of convert from different formats to XML, um, but anyone who's worked in it knows you have to sort of massage it or do it manually or use a vendor who has expertise in this. Um, and so this is something knowing that you're going to need to be able to, you need to be able to produce XML. Um, that's just really important um, that the journals understand and that they're sort of prepared for that and either have expertise in-house or mm, I think more likely and probably recommended using a vendor or a service that can produce this um, and do it right. And if there's any problems, it's their problem, not the journal's problem. Um, so also uh, within these, making sure you have high quality digital images. Um, this is something some journals struggle with because sometimes what the author submits, especially if it's embedded in the Word doc, is a compressed, very small version. And so you need to make sure you're getting those larger versions. Um, and sometimes in a PDF, you know, as you're making it, you don't zoom in and so it looks fine. But if you increase the size of that, you suddenly realize it's very grainy and that can be a problem when applying for uh, PubMed Central. So a PDF and then um, supplementary files. So some of the challenges here is that it's not just XML. It needs to be a specific uh, structure of XML. And so you'll see this term DTD. Again, many of you might be familiar with this. You'll find, you know, most people in academia in the world are not familiar. So DTD, document type definition, this defines what's allowable within a structure. So within XML, you can put anything, but a DTD says, well, we don't allow these sorts of things to make sure that it follows our standards. So JATS um, XML, is what um, is sort of the most common for PubMed Central, but doesn't have to be. Um, I think uh, during the application process, if you have an alternative, you can discuss with them. If you're, unless your journal is a special reason, I would generally recommend JATS XML, wonderful standard. High, you know, most journals are using this. Um, lots of documentation, there's good validators around this. So there's just a lot of tools to kind of support that. So normally JATS, um, but again, if journals don't know how to produce it, that's a challenge. Another one is uh, copyright um, license. So again, a lot of editors don't know a lot about this. Um, you know, sort of, if you, if you ask them who has the copyright, um, they might say the journal or the author. Well, one, that needs to be defined and written somewhere. Um, you know, it needs to be a, a journal policy. This is one of the most common things we see with newer journals um, and newer publishers is that they don't have a formal policy on this. Um, and so that's something you can support, you know, library publishers, I think know, you know, 
are, are some of the best both informed and advocates for sensible copyright um, rules. And so I think being able to support them. So of course, for example, a CCBY license, sometimes editors will start doing research and pick a more restrictive one than they need because they're thinking, well, what if an author has a concern? I'd rather never have to deal with that. I'll pick one that sort of seems to protect the most. Um, but again, they're not experts in this. You're probably more of an expert in this or have access to someone who's an expert. So recommending what the license is is, is uh, really great. And then for the technical challenge, the article types, um, many journals, you know, again, newer journals will publish articles and implicitly the author and the editor understand, oh, this is original research. This is a case report. This is more of a overview. Um, but that article type actually needs to be explicit, so, so usually in the HTML or PDF, but also in the XML. So if it's a clinical case report that needs to be defined. Um, and so making that really, really clear is something, you know, again, it's been a bit of a stumbling block. Um, and then whenever the, the journal's sending articles sometimes, and we saw this once, the first set of articles the journal got together, they sort of picked five. Well, the most recent five were all, I actually forget what they were, but let's say they were all case reports. You really want to have a mix of those types uh, for the application. That way it's easy to see, yes, you, you, these are the kinds of articles you, you publish. Um, I mentioned the validator. So this is what it looks like. So PMC, um, you know, if you have someone really technical, they can actually do some of this locally on their own their own development machine, but uh, PubMed Central has a validator you can upload a file to, um, and it'll look through the XML and make sure it's structured correctly and meets um, the DTD. And so, again, if you're working with a vendor or someone who's creating this, you don't have to worry about this. If for some reason the journal is using, I'm trying to think, um, using uh, Oxygen or the, they're using um, an editor to create their own XML, making sure your, your XML is passing this validator is huge, because if it doesn't, um, you're going to get to that, you're going to apply, get to that technical check, and, and it's not going to work. And that's, again, a rejection. That's an off-ramp that we want to avoid. So if, you know, how, and I also say, it's not terrible to get examples from your vendor and run them through here. Um, it should pass. And so, you know, no problem. If it doesn't pass, that's a good conversation to have with them and say, why did it not pass? Or you just need to fix this. Related, and this is, I don't know, this is, this was surprising to me as we got into this. So, again, I, I have a little bit of a technical background. There was that XML validator, and in my mind it was, okay, if it passes that, we're, you know, everything's done. And I've learned working with journals that you can have valid XML, but when you upload it with the file, you know, with the images, with the entire package that's going to go into PubMed Central, it might not look right. And when I say look right, sometimes it's, it's conventions. You know, what, what's a superscript? Um, what is, um, you know, what, how do captions appear in figures? There's just lots of things that you could put in the XML and it's valid. But when a researcher mm -hmm. looks at it, it won't look right. And that's one thing I'll note is we've also worked with publishers, um, campus-based publishers, where the person working on this project is not a scholar in that field. And, and I would encourage you, you know, to work with the publisher. If you're very familiar with the conventions of how these articles should look, you can do this role. If not, get the journal to have someone do this. When they upload something into this, um, PMC has this tool called the Article Previewer, where it actually doesn't just check the XML, it, it renders it and then gives style. Have them look at this maybe with an article from another journal that's in PubMed Central that they would love to emulate, and just look at everything and say, does this look right? Um, because sometimes it won't. Um, and again, that's, for me, that's, that's, uh, can be confusing the idea. It's valid, but looks wrong. <laughs> so uh, these are two great tools um, that uh, are provided, so I encourage you to use them. So that last step after the technical check is um, pre-production. And so a lot of this is um, the, I think, signing the agreements, getting that, um, that banner that they have, and a few other steps, and then it's released. Um, and then, then the journal will be in PMC. Great. Um, 
So, so going back to, you know, before you even start this application, because that was an overview of what it looks like, but I would encourage the journal to start by, do we have the appropriate content? Do we have the appropriate content, including as the majority of it in English? The publication history, um, you need 25 published articles. We've had journals start the application and they don't have 25 articles. That's, a, a, again, a, a very clear line um, to draw. It also needs to be a regular publication history, meaning if the journal published five articles in 2018 and 20 articles in 2020, that would not look like a regular publication history. And so again, the, the idea is that PMC and other indexes um, want to see that the journal is consistently putting out content. And it's also a marker that the journal is gonna be around. Um, you know, if they publish 25 articles once, you don't know if they're gonna do any more in the future. I already mentioned, does the journal have an ISSN? And then um, things like, are the is the editorial board clearly delineated on the website? Um, again, things you might just assume, but sometimes the journals have it in the PDF. You know, they have their issue PDF with all their editors and they're not listed. Um, that's pretty rare. I think most journals do this, but um, it's just something to check. PMC links to sort of two sets of recommendations for making sure the journal has responsible and sort of um, uh, normal practices around scientific publishing. Uh, one is ICMJE um, has a set of recommendations and it's joint statement from DOAJ, COPE, OASPA, and um, WAME. I don't know if that's pronounced WAME or they say WAME. Uh, and so, but all, this, this one is uh, I think really important because some journals are not as familiar with um, all the different kinds of policies that they should have in place, especially when it's a newer journal, because they haven't experienced some of the problems that these policies are meant to address. And I'll, I'll give some examples. Um, first, for, for looking at these, uh, PMC, and I have a link at the bottom here, has some examples, basically questions. So PMC says they're gonna look holistically. Um, so this, these are less checkboxes and more guiding um, to get a sense of the journal's uh, policies and um, if they're following best practices. But he, here's some, you know, the journal's aims and scope, great. Are the journal's ethical policies, policies clearly stated and adhered to? That's one that, again, if you put your grant uh, writer hat on and say, if I look at this journal's website, is it extremely obvious what their ethical policies are and how they adhere to them? And the answer is not, you know, most obviously you would expect a section of the website with a title that says ethical policies, adhering to them. And if you have those, it's easy to check. If you don't have those, it's harder to check. Um, and I'll go into some more examples. Uh, well, PMC also has a lot of things separate from policies around their um, things like figures, uh, formatting. So these are great and you should look into. Um, some of the areas of confusion we've seen come up, and I think that if you're working with a journal who's applying to PMC or other indexes as well, um, that I thought was, were worth sharing. So one is, if, if the first issue was special, so I'll, I'll give an example. The first issue was solicited from the editorial board. Um, when they apply to PMC, that might not be obvious, and what PMC might, the reviewers might look at it and say, huh, half of the articles, half of the 25 articles that we're looking at were written by the editors of this journal. And we look at the website, we don't see um, anything talking about, you know, uh, how do we handle if an editor publishes? How is the peer review modified if an editor wants to publish in the journal? So that's a red flag. Um, you can be explicit about that both within the individual article. So, you know, make mention, say often it's a footnote um, about that, you know, this was an invited article or something to that degree. But having journal level policies is really important. Um, you know, as, uh, and a lot of this boils down to conflict of interest. How is this acknowledged? Does the journal define how they will handle this both historically, but moving forward? If someone has, if it's an editor of the journal or 
if the journal is sponsored, uh, has sponsorship or advertising revenue, and an author is affiliated with one of those sponsors, how is that handled? How is that um, accounted for within the review process or um, how is the scientific integrity protected? So that's, that's an area, again, I think many library publishers have, can give a lot of great guidance on, including look at other journals and the kind of policies they uh, delineate and um, using those as models. Um, also those resources that I mentioned before, um, for example, the joint statement, uh, those really do outline sort of what is expected and, and what, what should a journal be doing and how should they articulate it. Another one is, especially for early journals, you know, sort of a, a basic, what you think would be a basic question, but who is the publisher? Sometimes we get that question and they say, oh, okay, we're going to list Scholastica as the publisher. And we say, well, no, no, we're not the publisher. We're hosting the content. Um, but you're the publisher. And then there's times they say, well, is it the editorial board? Is it my university? Um, and again, I think, you know, the, our, the library publishers, you might have experienced this, but you can definitely give guidance. If the journal is not incorporated, um, that might be something that's worth doing, um, you know, creating a nonprofit or affiliating it with an association or with the campus-based publishing program. But the idea of being able to say, where does this journal live? Um, a question that will also come up to us whenever this, around who's the publisher, um, is, well, I think it's my university. My university must be the publisher. We say, well, when you, if you are done in three to five years in your role as editor-in-chief, will your university continue to support this or would you expect the next editor-in-chief's university? And if it's the latter, again, it, it, that's not correct. Um, and so sort of who's, who's uh, you know, it, who, whose enterprise is this journal and making sure that um, that can be identified. And it's, again, should ideally be easy, but I think as many of you have experienced, sometimes these journals have been up and running for a long time and it's very unclear who owns it or who's the decision maker because all these journals are passion projects. They are things started by scholars who saw um, a lacuna in their field and really wanted to uh, contribute towards it or help define a subfield and didn't, you know, there's never been an issue with needing to know who owns it. And so this topic never particularly came up. So area to look at. And another area is, uh, again, back to these policies is, you know, many journals have never dealt with either in their own experience as a researcher and definitely not in their role as an editor or a publisher is, well, what happens if someone disagrees with your decision to reject an article? How does your journal process that? If, um, if someone says, we think there was a conflict with the reviewers or editors have a bias against us, uh, how, how is your journal going to process that? And again, that's an area many newer journals or newer publishers don't articulate on their website and haven't thought through And those two things are related. So being able to help the journal um, understand sort of how, how can you handle that and um, along with those resources I mentioned before, um, COPE, which I know many of you are familiar with, have, have some great resources for outlining how should you handle this. For PubMed Central, I mean, so we've gone over a lot of tips. You know, I, I mentioned those different off-ramps. I mean, a major consequence is if the journal gets rejected in any of those stages, it can't apply again for 24 months. So again, the idea of get it right, uh, or sort of check all the boxes, do your own internal audit before you apply is really important because if you apply and it doesn't go well, um, you know, it can be really demoralizing for the editorial board and the research is going to be less discoverable if they don't get into PubMed Central. And if that's one of their major goals, um, not accomplishing that, again, can be very disappointing and have an impact on the journal's future. So being able to support these journals and, and understand this is this is weighty and that it, it, it is going to, it could lead to a long delay before you can apply again. Um, if, the, if the publisher is thinking about getting multiple journals in, just know that, um, I actually don't remember this is a hard and fast rule, and I believe it is, but that 
Um, you have one journal, the publisher will get one journal in, needs to sort of be in PubMed Central uh, for six months, then you'll have the opportunity to continue adding more. Um, and then if the journals are looking at Medline, um, which for different reasons, they, they might really want to be in Medline. Um, they, there's some different requirements. Um, some of them are a little more stringent. And, and if the real goal is to get into PubMed, which again, remember is that search engine above the triangle, then Pub, um, PubMed Central is a faster route to that. So if they're torn um, and the real goal is to get into PubMed, I would recommend doing that first. So so that's, you know, talking about PubMed Central, I, I wanna take a minute um, or a few minutes and sort of look beyond that. Cause I think in your role um, as a library publisher, you're probably going to work with journals um, who wanna get into, you know, big, sort of initial indexes like Google Scholar or Director of Open Access Journals or um, you know, uh, discipline specific indexes. We wanna talk about some tips and experiences from other indexes. Um, so the first one I'll mention is um, Google Scholar. So I think many of you are familiar with this. Um, for a lot of academics, even if they have access to all these different um, aggregators and indexes, you know, they sort of would assume their journals should be in Google Scholar um, when they know lots of people do initial searches in that or might do quick searches and so it's and it's a really wonderful way to increase um, the discoverability of the articles so this this one comes up very frequently um, so important point here is google scholar is not the same as google in terms of the search engines so when we first when i was first helping start scholastica um, and we started working with google scholar that's just what i assumed is that we'll Google's search engine is a super fast crawler. It's going across, you know, whatever it is, trillions of trillions of trillions of web pages. And, you know, it's this incredibly well-resourced, super fast um, index builder. Um, and so that's what we should expect with Google Scholar, right? No, it is a different technology. Um, it also has a different concern. I mean, Google's looking at trying to give search results um, based on, you know, a lot of different criteria. Google Scholar also wants to connect these articles, connect the citations, and there's an academic context. And so um, they're not the same. And I've also learned over time, you know, not only is the context different, but the technology is different, the team is different. So for example, I don't know how many, how many people work on Google search. Um, I'm sure it's t tens of thousands. Someone here can fact check that and tell me if I'm wrong. Um, Google Scholar um, has very few people. For example, in 2014, they had nine people. I believe um, that they have somewhere around that now, maybe 11. So, I mean, that's a sort of, I think for a lot of us, very surprisingly small team for something that's so important within academic publishing um, and is, I think, very widely used. Um, it's also incredibly impressive that that sort of small team um, can produce a product that's used, you know, sort of so widely. Um, but just knowing that, because that can also help some of the expectations I'm going to talk about um, in a moment. So the first thing is, if you remember in PubMed Central, the journal uploads XML. In Google Scholar, you don't. It, it does crawl. So it, it comes and reads the page. It reads the, you know, the meta tags. Um, oh, this is a great audience. I don't have to explain metadata in detail. Um, so the metadata are really what are read by the crawler, um, not the human readable version. Um, one, one thing to know is that it's also pulling in data from multiple sources. So with PubMed Central, you're uploading your XML, so you're the source. Google Crawler finds your article, but if that article is hosted somewhere else, that's another place. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And again, the different meta tags, and there are many of them, um, title, author, abstract, or authors, I mean, multiple of those. Um, you know, the DOI, the PDF, um, I think references, I mean, tons of tags you can include in here. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I found interesting very early on was, I mean, when, if, you're, if you go and look and say, okay, I'm hosting my journal, I wanna get in Google Scholar, or it's most commonly it's, huh, why is my journal not in Google Scholar? Um, you look in here and this is a page that Google um, uh, has around their inclusion guidelines. And what I'll highlight here is, I mean, for me, this kind of boils down to 
them saying, look, if you can use someone who's already done this, do that. And that could be something like, you know, Adapon, Highwire, Silverchair, uh, Scholastica. Also, if not, they said, if you're going to host it yourself, they basically say, we recommend OJS. Um, journals will host things on WordPress or, um, you know, their own site, or if their university hosts the journal on a different platform, um, then, you know, then Google says, great, then you need to go over the technical guidelines. Okay. So let's look at those. Um, it looks like this. I'm not going to go into detail, but just thought it would be useful and, um, to see this. So they have a similar structure. The idea is content. It needs to be academic. Um, and then there's technical pieces. What does the metadata need to be, um, et cetera. Google, also has, Google Scholar also has this on their page, which I thought was um, interesting. This is so much work. Isn't there an easier way? Because I can't get all these tags to be exactly correct. Google kind of circles back and says, maybe consider using a, um, someone who's already done this, so software or hosting solution. Um, and they kind of refer you back to that piece around existing services or something open source like OJS. Um, and this matches our experiences that you can follow the technical guidelines. And we've supported journals trying to do that. And then um, years ago, we had to do this ourselves to make sure everything was in Google Scholar. And, and it's, it, it isn't sort of as automatic and direct as one would expect. So, um, you know, we've had journals do this and again, because they know we're knowledgeable, they've said, look, you know, we have this website, we're hosting stuff, it's not showing up. Do you know anything about it? They come to us with, you know, this idea of, I think I did everything, but I'm not a Google scholar. What can I do? Um, so a few different examples that I'll go. One is, um, uh, well, I should mention, I mean, part of our experience of that was things are shown in Google Scholar is we, we ultimately got a contact at Google Scholar in the same way you see like Silverchair and Adapon, um, you know, and OJS have sort of nailed this and they know, you know, they sort of have the, um, the setup for Google Scholar. We had done everything technical and it, but talking with them, there were additional steps we could do that were not documented that ended up making it very helpful for our, the journals we're hosting to make sure that they show up quickly in Google Scholar and correctly. Um, other issues that come up is once journals are in Google Scholar, and this is, I think, going to be really useful for campus-based publishers, um, some of your journals might have this, is uh, they say, wait, but things don't look right. We're in there, but it doesn't look right. What's going on? Okay, so one thing is, say a journal changes something. They realize they had a typo. You know, they, they had the wrong year, or the journal name changed, you know, two years in, um, and it's not showing up. You know, they've refreshed over and over. Google Scholar has this note saying, you know, changes can take six to nine months. I mean, if you think about this crawler and with Google, I think we're used to thinking of it updating very rapidly. Like, you, you know, I think you often think, okay, a day or two, maybe, you know, if you change your website, it'll show up. Um, maybe a few weeks. Google Scholar can be a lot longer. Um, and so that's just worth knowing. And so that can be really frustrating to journals if they change something and they go to Google Scholar and the error still sits there. Um, and I'll say from our experience, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, you can wait. There's some proactive steps you can take um, to submit um, errors, but just it really does take a while, especially if you're not using a service like one of the ones listed um, uh, or Scholastica um, who, who, who can ping Google Scholar you know, about changes. Um, but even in these our experiences, Google Scholar has their own algorithms. We can't do anything about that. And sometimes it just takes a long time. So that's a note. Um, someone comes to you. You can spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to update Google Scholar. And again, most of it boils down to you can't, you need to wait. So that's a note. Um, I know not a happy one, but it's a note. Another one we've seen is people saying, look, here's my, uh, this is my article, but I have an HTML article. Why is it only linking the PDF? I want people to see the nice, you know, full text version. Um, and so, you know, we've we've spoken to um, Google Scholar, and their answer basically boils down to, you know, if if these you can see down here where it says, um, uh, or that they said like, uh, basically it's it's a complex heuristic. So they have a way where they just they the algorithm picks what article, if they see different versions, you know, PDF, XML, HTML, they're going to pick one to show first. 
Um, and they sort of said, sometimes it gets it wrong. And that's not something easily changeable. So especially if it's been indexed, it might, even if, even if it could become HTML, again, that might take a long time. Back to that previous slide about taking six to nine months. So that's a note. Another one that we've had journals sort of be frustrated by is, you know, here's an article where when you search for that title, the first hit is from ResearchGate um, or some other external source. Um, well, down here, if you click that um, all five versions, um, if you see down there, what, what you'll see is um, that your version does show up. So here's the one on that journal's actual website. Um, but again, Google Scholar is finding these articles in different places and how it decides to rank them is again, something they control that's part of their algorithm. And it's not something you can really dictate or control. Um, and that can be frustrating. Um, but again, at least our experience thus far has been working with them is that you can't really do anything about it. Um, and so again, not, maybe not super helpful, but at least honest. Um, last example I talk, I'll talk about the directory of open access journals. I think a lot of you are familiar with this. A uh, note I'll say, you know, along with it being a wonderful sort of barometer for ethical open access journals, it's also required for Plan S. Um, and so there's a lot of journals who are more um, sort of interested in getting into this. Um, one thing I, I try and proselytize for is getting in DOAJ, we think should not just be getting your journal listed, put your articles into it. Um, for many journals, something they're not aware of is that DOAJ, those metadata cascade into, into other aggregators like WorldCat um, and even some of the um, aggregators and uh, sort of larger indexes will pull data out of DOAJ, including articles. So you're by getting into DOAJ and putting your articles in it, not just your journal metadata, but your article metadata, that can lead to your articles being discoverable in many other places. So it's uh, a really great one to do. The inclusion form is pretty similar. Um, I'll note it has about 60 questions, um, so I would look through it and then get prepared. You do upload XML. It's not um, JATS, uh, or I should say it's not the same format as PMC. It's uh, DOAJ has a DTD, and they use the Crossref DTD. Um, and so, and they have updates. I, I know they updated something else around this recently. I'm just, I don't remember right now, but those are the two to look at. Um, and there are some places, DOAJ links to a place where you can same as PMC, but you can validate your XML by putting up your XML and XSD, which is a way to define whether it's correct or not. This is what the form looks like. Um, I would say is, you know, as a library publisher, um, areas you can really help. There are a few questions about copyright and licensing. We've had journals come to us um, or the publishers come to us and say, we, we don't know how to answer this. Um, and so you being able to help them understand not only picking a license, but, you know, is, is this displayed um, and answer these, you know, help the journal answer these yes or no. Um, Cause again, many of the scholars running these journals um, just aren't familiar with, um, they're not as comfortable with copyright and licensing. So a few takeaways, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, but start with the inclusion guidelines, make sure to do the technical check. No, it can be confusing. Um, if you can work with a vendor, great. Work with your partners or other journals who are in the index. Um, and involve them early before you apply. That way, if there's easy answers they can give you or hurdles they can help you avoid or hurdle, I'm not sure which one you want to do, um, clear the hurdle, uh, that can be really useful. And get all those boxes checked, then apply. Um, we'll include this, but some few, few different links, um, inclusion guidelines. We've done interviews with different people from these um, services um, and done overviews that we share with our publishers when they're applying. Um, and again, for this q and I, I really want to emphasize uh, hearing from other people. I think many people um, who are uh, library publishers have helped uh, journals apply for inclusion indexes or done it themselves. And I'm, I'm sure they could share a lot of examples from different fields uh, or for PubMed Central, Google Scholar, DOAJ, tips that would help us, again, avoid problems. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully my two and a half year old is asleep now. And so I'll be coming now to do the Q&A's live. All right, thank you.